Welcome to the Asking Why podcast. I'm your host, Clint Davis. I'm a marriage and family therapist and licensed professional counselor trained in trauma and addiction. The Asking Why podcast is for anyone on a journey of healing and restoration. If you are searching for answers to life's questions and want to learn more about root causes from a psychological and theological mix, this show is for you. In this podcast, myself and a co-host from Clint Davis Counseling and Integrative Wellness will interview guests on a wide range of topics in order to get down to the heart of the problems facing our world and understand why things happen and how to change the world and ourselves for the better. Want to learn more tips and tricks to living a healthy lifestyle? Visit us at Clint Davis Counseling and Integrative Wellness on Facebook and Instagram. If you want to meet our staff or book a speaker, go to clintdaviscounseling.com. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe today. All right. Well, today, um, episode 23 of Asking Why podcast, um, happy to have Dr. Mona Delahook Hook on here. Am I saying that right? That's right. Yeah. Delahook. Yep. Okay. So <laughs> you. you've written, we've talked, we've been on, on here for about 15 minutes talking and I've been following you on Instagram, following you on Facebook, social media, um, and you are just an amazing person um, that I look up to, that I respect in the world of neuropsychology, uh, neuroplasticity, all the things that you're studying um, that I'll butcher if I try to talk to talk about too much. Um, <laughs> and so you have a book called Beyond Behaviors. You have several books, but that's the one that's recent. And yeah. so part of the goal of the podcast today is to you know, talk to the average person that listens to our podcast, the average parent, the clinician, um, the nurse, the doctor, whoever's out there who's dealing with children, um, to give them a different perspective and, and kind of pair research with um, parenting skills and life skills to really help uh, do no harm um, moving forward. And so I'm so thankful for you to take the time to be on here with me today and, and honored to have you. Oh, it is, it's a joy for me to be here. I'm so excited. I love this is what I love to talk about. So thank you for having me. So first, tell us a little bit about kind of your story and uh, what your background is and, and how you came about doing what you do. Well, um, my background is as a clinical psychologist. I decided I wanted to study. I, I found um, human beings very interesting from the time I was little. So I, I decided I wanted to, to I found, when I found out you could study human beings and it was called psychology, I just decided to do that in my teens. So I ran through um, uh, my bachelor's and master's and PhD degrees um, in my, you know, right. I just didn't take any time off. I ran straight through, but I had my PhD by the time I was 26. Wow. So, yeah. Um, but think about like how much, you know, really at 26 versus later in yeah, life, sure. <laughs> I didn't have kids yet. And I, but I was a student. So I, um, I was practicing for about a decade uh, with looking, t uh, treating teenagers and couples and adults and um, occasionally children when I realized that I felt like my training was kind of falling short. Mm -hmm. And I wondered about talk therapy because I was using, you know, that's how we're mostly trained as, as mental health professionals, right? And talk therapy, helping people figure things out by talking about it, using yeah. their mind to talk about it. And I was, I, you know, I thought, wow, this is like not, um, it's, it's, it wasn't very satisfying, but the other piece that I came about, um, was that so many of the adults that I talked about had either toxic stress or trauma that they told me about in their histories Absolutely. when they were little. And when I heard that, I kept on thinking, wow, I wish I could have, um, counseled your your parents or your caregivers when you were that young or I wish I would have seen your family when you were five or eight or or three on some of these early memories that you had because there's there were patterns there so long story short I after about a decade in practice with my regular PhD uh, psychology degree I went back to get a postdoctoral specialization in infant and toddler development. Oh, wow. And that was the portal. That is an unusual small subspecialty in mental health. Um, and it was a really hard program to find. So I had to, it was, a, it was a, yeah, it took a long year, time to find it. What year was that? And that was in, um, it, the program started, uh, one of them was in 97, 1997. The other one started in 1990 nine yeah. to 2001. Well, that's so interesting because, you know, 
I guess what the diagnosis for PTSD and trauma was somewhere around what 1984 or something that we even put that in the DSM. So you're talking yes. about 11 or 12 years after, you know, really it even being a thing and you're looking that for some so kind crazy. of program to educate you and teach you as a therapist on, you know, the childhood issues with those things. And I tell, right. pe I tell people all the time, you know, like this idea of parenting, you know, is a new concept, you know, child psychology in the fifties. I mean, so we're still, you know, in, in the infancy stage of understanding, mm. you know, child development and brains. And yet, you know, yeah, you could see those missing pieces. I mean, that's, I think that's very similar to my story and going to Fuller and coming back out and coming back to Louisiana mm. and being very trauma informed from my own work in the MDR and my own personal therapy. And then also just learning things there and then coming back and being like, wait, not everybody is trained in systems theory and trauma and you know, and you're just like, hold on, we got to, we got to figure out a system here where, you know, these people can get help. And cause when you work with trauma victims, you start thinking about the preventative, yes. you know, you start thinking about, okay, well this all happened 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and it's going to keep happening if we don't do anything about the current. So I think that's one, I mean, that's one thing I love about you is this, just that passion for educating parents, educating caregivers, you know, anybody dealing with children to prevent these things mm -hmm. that we have seen all these adults suffer with and struggle with as adults. So that's awesome. Mm, thank you. No, I, sure. I'm glad you pointed out that this is an emerging field because truly you're right. Our studying of trauma in the eighties. Now for some people um, who are, who are younger that the eighties might seem like so long ago, like when you were, when, when you were born, yep. but um, in the history of our field, uh, the transformations of information that have come in in the last decade and a half, even the decade of the brain officially was in the 1990s right. to 2000. And so really it hasn't trickled down um, in any big way yet for in education or in, in, in our, the way our um, psychology field is training. It's coming in, it's trickling in, of course, because trauma, especially with trauma informed care for adults, finally, the and, um, embodied um, experiences, right? And body, body, um, the, the famous book by Bessel van der Kolk, The Body Keeps the Score, right? Yep. That was a just a real um, game changer. Oh, a game changer, a call to the world that there is that there is so much more going on. And yeah, and then I did, and then so once I studied that, I realized that these behaviors that are so often given a DSM diagnosis, um, those are the children that I would be called into the school district for an IEP or a meeting um, or a pediatrician calling referring a parent to me for a child with challenging behaviors, I realized that the pathways that help human beings control their emotions and behaviors are the same pathways that cause trauma in some people. Yep. And that the information wasn't yet translated into um, how we view children with, um, with uh, extreme challenges in their emotional and behavioral in their emotions and behavioral control. Right. Cause it's barely transferred over to those of us who quote unquote are the normies who, you know, don't have any necessarily different difficulties. And that's, that's one thing that I find interesting because I think what's so beautiful about what you're talking about is, is the population you're talking about is a huge number of people, but also, uh, you know, when like, uh, what is it? TBRI and, and, uh, we're close yeah. to TCU. So a lot of people have been over to TCU for TBRI training. And I, uh -huh. I love yes. that. But I, I had a, I had a, uh, we were in this big meeting with like 30 different people who are providers and juvenile court. And, and the lady's like, oh, I just thought this is an amazing way to, you know, to treat people with trauma and talk to them calmly and deescalate them. And I raised my hand. I was like, it, wouldn't it be nice if the premise was that's how we treat all children? Yeah. You know, like trauma informed care is just actually what we should be doing with kids in general. Oh, Clint, you hit the nail on the head. This is for all humans. Yeah. It, and, and for all mammals, really, I mean, the, the, the sense of um, holding the relationship of uh, as the main um, as the main portal for our relating to other people and children and those in distress and how we view distress, we seem to have come to some appreciation for its impact in trauma. 
but we have to now build a bridge yeah. and understand that in regular what it, what we might call neurotic neurotypical development if there even is such a thing because i'm beginning to think we're all neurodiverse i, I agree um, but uh to, to bring it into our our regular education system and into our parenting um is really a really exciting thing absolutely so let's get to that so beyond behaviors yeah. tell me kind of what led you i mean this is what led you to writing that book um so tell me kind of what was your main focus in writing the book or kind of who, who needs to read it? Right. So my, my idea on writing the book, I'll, re I'll never forget the moment I decided that I was going to write a book because I, um, it, it wasn't in my um, overall grand plan. Cause to, you got all the time in the book. world, right? <laughs> right. I love being a psychologist and I ha had and have a super busy practice, but I'll never forget um, I was sitting in a classroom, a special ed classroom, uh, just being a fly on the wall, observing one of my little patients in the, cl in, in the classroom. And he was struggling with holding his body still. And he was on a, uh, he had an aid and there was a, a big behavior plan in place to help him um, get through the day. And he was having a hard time listening to the teacher reading a story or doing a, a lesson. And he started touching, uh, trying to touch the aid. And uh, when he did that, she moved away so that he couldn't touch her. And he was, she was an amazing person. She, she loved this, this little boy, but she was trained and told to when he starts to have um, behaviors that are considered disruptive to mm -hmm. the rest of the class to just ignore it. So she moved away and then his body started moving more and, um, she she kept on saying just pay attention pay attention and he couldn't and so she moved uh, out of his line of vision and when she when that happened he tipped over in his chair to try to see her because mm -hmm. he was i knew he was trying to maintain some level of connection with her and he flipped over on his chair and the teacher deemed that as uh, a purposeful misbehavior so they put him they brought him to what was known as the calm down room in the in the in the room which was a padded room with a little window um where the aide went and sat by him and i noticed him hitting his head against the wall yeah and at that moment i realized that the structure for understanding observable behaviors was significantly flawed in terms of what we know mm -hmm. about the brain and body yeah i knew that what that child was going through was a stress reaction that his behaviors weren't voluntary they were involuntary something we call part of the fight or flight system right. of the autonomic nervous system and indeed he was the the proof was that the more the human connection was taken the what taken away the worse his behavior behaviors became because he was more desperate to connect yeah. and that's when beyond my idea for bike beyond behaviors was born because I want, I had by that time I had hundreds of stories, similar stories yeah, for sure. And I wanted to wait until I had hundreds because I certainly didn't want to dist and I don't want to distress parents or teachers. I uh, work on a model of um, compassion and self-compassion. And I didn't want this to be something where it was, I am I'm showing you where, where the traditional approaches are wrong, yeah. but rather shifting the lens to us working together to incorporate the nervous system into our treatment. Yeah. I mean, that's so beautiful. And as you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, that is part of the problem though, right? Is that that personal responsibility is so hard because when we find ourselves, I mean, even, you know, in, with me, I, I, you know, one of our friends here, uh, one of our best friends is a dietitian and she's on staff with us. Her name's Ashley Rochelle. And she did our podcast a few months ago and it was on eating and, you know, like not doing diets, but focus on, you know, the right things. And it was amazing. But nice. yeah, as I'm yeah. listening to it, I'm like, oh man, I, I need to change what I'm doing in a couple of areas with my kids to be more healthy. <sighs> but if you're, if you're not differentiated, if you're not, you know, doing the work, then so much shame comes on you when you realize you've been doing the wrong thing. And not necessarily the wrong thing, but maybe not the best option. You hear, right. I've been doing the wrong thing, therefore I'm bad. Yeah. Which which is funny because all of that feeds into making what you're saying true. 
right, is that not only are the kids feeling that way, but we can just look at our own lives and our own selves and go, oh, I'm in fight or flight. I'm in shame just by you telling me that this system is not as best as it could be. And so it's yes. interesting to me that like when you yes. when you call out something or you say, hey, maybe we can do this, that people's anger and their frustration or their rejection of it is is really proving that they're in fight or flight. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. It, it makes sense on uh, when you when you study the nature of human behaviors. Right. That when we feel we are vulnerable creatures, we feel shamed so easy. Parents and, and myself, for you know, for sure. I mean, I raised my ki- my kids when they were younger without the benefit of any knowledge of the autonomic nervous <laughs> system. <laughs> and um, I can tell you, I was uh, my husband and I were watching videos uh because my children are now young adults we are watching a videotape of where one of my children had a disruptive behavior and i with a very stern voice sent her into a timeout right and oh i just cringed and i felt so much shame and guilt and so i want parents and teachers to know that when you hear about this this new way of thinking about things hold yourself in the arms of compassion yes. because we're all learning. Absolutely. We're all learning. And, and you know what? It's okay. My children turned out fine. And we have a lot of stories that we can share together sure. of laughing at the learning curve I was on, right? As yeah. a, as a mom, as a psychologist, parenting is the hardest job in the world. I know everyone says that, but it's so true. Wow. Yeah. It's even worse if you're in the mental health field. <laughs> you know what? I tell my wife all the time, like, I know way too much and I screw way too much up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so with with that, what do you, you say there's these three things, um, three major things that we're missing, right? Uh, we don't look at the cause, we don't individualize the process, and we don't use a developmental approach. So can you talk through kind of what those things yeah. are and then why you think that is that we don't do it? Right. Okay, so when I learned about infant and toddler development, I found the backfill of how little humans learn how to control their emotions and behaviors. Mm -hmm. In psychology, um, they tell you how to help children think think differently and essentially build what's known as the executive function right let's help let's let me help you think about this a little in in a different way, but what I what we what we miss is that if you don't have a developmental framework for your child or for the child you're working with, if they don't have the substrate, the foundation for being able to talk about what's going on for them, and that involves nonverbal communication, pre-verbal, meaning before language, Mm -hmm. it has to do with body language, it has to do with signaling, with something called social communication. If you don't understand where each person, including an adult, is in their social and emotional development, then you don't know where to target your intervention. You right. don't know where to help the child. And that's what I, I, I filled in, I think, in Beyond Behaviors, um, realizing that uh, giving parents and teachers a, uh, a roadmap for a very basic way of understanding where a child is developmentally and social, emotionally, and then also... Um, figuring out through an analysis of underneath the tip of the iceberg. So I kind of use this analogy of an iceberg. So behaviors are the tip, but you know, underneath that big iceberg is uh, hidden from view. If you're on top of the water of all those causes and triggers. And so that's the, that's the third part. We look at the individual differences. We look at the developmental level and we look at, um, uh, causes rather than the behavior as the target. We look at underneath the behavior. We look at the reasons that the behavior is there. That's so awesome. One of the things I say all the time, um, on the other podcasts and just in general is, you know, and, and you probably, this, this will hit home for you, but you know, all, it's so amazing to me that all of our systems are, are built on behavior modification. And what I mean by that is our prison system, our judiciary system, our police force, I mean, in some ways, religion, um, American Christianity, you know, it, it, it can be so behavior focused and it misses the heart. And, and not only does it miss the heart, but it misses the mind and the soul. And, and, and to us would be measurable neurology, which is so 
so amazing. It's that if you study the brain, like you do, if you study children and adults and uh, trauma, which we've been able to do more in the last you know couple decades, you see this pattern that oh, it's not about behavior, you know. And and for me as a Christian, you know, God says that like it's not about your behavior, it's not about what you can do, it's not about what you can't do, it's not about what you can earn or what you lose. It's about who I say you are and who I've adopted you into and the family that I've adopted you into. So it's crazy to me as a Christian because the neurology points to that. You know, the science points to that. And so unfortunately, the systems aren't set up that way. And so I always, you know, I'll talk about like the education system or the school system. I'm like, do you think a bunch of people who understood neurology and who understood psychology sat around and said, let's make this system that's best for humans? No, <laughs> you know, like, no. It's yeah, and and the history of that is so interesting because, you know, when the science of of um, behavioral uh, reinforcement was began to be studied in the beginning in the the beginning of the nineteenth century, I believe yeah. there was a Pavlov in mm-hmm. Russia, and um, here in the in the United States um, we had Watson and. Um, and uh, the other psychologists at, at Harvard, you know, Skinner. Yep. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and Skinner and the Skinner box and um, this uh, idea that that there's a they they created a very interesting science around behavior modification of animals. Yeah. So in those original uh, rat studies, it was very interesting that you could train a rat to do a certain thing to get a couple pellets, right, and then measure those in 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 scientific studies measure what the outcome was so it was a very interesting study this of course was way before uh, back then they they had a kind of a homunculus idea of the brain right, right. Little pieces of the brain all all cut up but that wasn't interacting with each other um but so so then you have this interesting study of behaviorism and then it got um taken up by probably a, a well-intentioned scientist, um, Ivar Lovas, right. uh, studying at the University of Washington, who was trying to help children with bad self-injure, self-injury behaviors, mm-hmm. right? And difficulties with communication and all that. So this, this idea of looking at be, of behavioral management got picked up by, um, by, those in the child development support field somehow related to autism got into UCLA where Ivar Lovas had a lab. And um, a lot of people don't know this, but but they had electrified floors Mm -hmm. where children were placed with the without shoes on and when they were engaging in certain behaviors they they had they were shocked right and so they yeah they stopped the behavior um but i'm not sure in those early studies if if they found out what happened to the emotional lives of those children um and i can only imagine that their anxiety and their fear of the world um was was off the charts so long answer to to what you what you said um we have a history, a very long history of focusing on behaviors and the education system picked it up. Mm -hmm. And I don't think our current um, mental health system has contextualized it properly enough yet. Yeah. And the reason I'm able to say that with certainty is now that I've been practicing for three decades, I've worked with children who had behavioral techniques um, and certain types of, of ways that they were treated when they were young who are now adults and talking about it and many of them did not feel respected and they felt like they were misunderstood because there many of them had communication problems meaning they couldn't speak out what they were thinking yeah but they were inside they were just so distressed at being given tokens and if you do this i'll give you something to eat or a treat they were very they felt dismissed by those programs yeah lots of shame lots of shame lots of shame and lots of attaboy you can do it try harder so that is another premise that we have to look at a misconstruction that if children only tried harder they could behave better yeah what do you mona what do you think about the idea because i'm just thinking about it out, out loud what do you think about the idea i mean 
because research is problematic in my in my view because you're assuming that the people in the research feel safe. And as you're saying this, I'm thinking about all the research that I read and all the things, you know, like, oh, we assess these people to do this. And it's like, well, we, with what we know about neuroscience, like they would have to feel safe to give you truth. Yes. Right. And yes. are these are these research things setting up safety or are they trying to get information based on, you know, and so, yeah, sorry. I just went down a long rabbit hole in my head. Um, no, does that I make love, sense? Because it's that, like. It totally makes sense. It's because like, how are we basing things on truth from people if we know now, hindsight, that most of them were traumatized and they haven't recovered, and now you're putting them in a, a power differential with a scientist or with a power structure and saying, tell me your truth, you know, don't eat this, do this, what did you think about your parents, were your parents abusive? And if we know none of these people have recovered from their trauma and dealt with it or have the education about it, then how are we taking that information and using that as a, a valid source of information, I guess? It's, it's an excellent point. It's one that Dr. Stephen Porges makes. Okay. He made this point at an address to, uh, um, I think, the um, a National um, Behavioral Analytical Association. It was a huge one many years ago. And he said, the thing I want you to remember is that you can pretty easily measure a stimulus and a response. But there's something called an intervening variable. And the intervening variable is the individual in the middle. Right, the person. It's the nervous system of the person. And, it's, and if you don't measure that, which brings us into something called chaos theory, because yeah, yeah. it's very difficult to do complex research. It's very easy to do simple research, Absolutely. right? And so we have all these quote unquote, evidence-based programs that public funds are used for because there's evidence behind them, but who's scrutinizing, like you said, the quality of those research projects? Because uh, no, none that I know of included physiological state as right. the intervening variable. Yeah, well, and, and what I was thinking was, is, is the reason that I'm so confident, and it sounds, you know, I know you and know you're so confident, and others, Dan Siegel, Tina Bryson, these amazing people are using neurology to shape and inform the way we parent, the way we do marriage, is that we actually have safe people in our offices who are being honest, finally. Right, that that we provide an area across socioeconomic status, across gender, across uh, you know sex, across ethnicity, and the same patterns are happening in those offices. And it doesn't matter what any of those numbers are, you know, what any of those kind of uh, what you would say variables would variables would be. They're all saying the same thing. And when you treat through some kind of trauma informed care, all of a sudden that person changes the way they think about themselves, changes the way they react. Their behavior does actually change, but it's not because we focus on the behavior. It's because we made them feel safe. Is that oh, brilliant? You nailed it on the head. It's <laughs> not because we focused on the behavior. It's because we help them feel safe. Right. And some individuals haven't felt safe in their bodies for a very long time. No, for sure. And it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's just brilliant. And Deb Dana, I don't know if you, she has written a book called the polyvagal theory yeah. in psychotherapy yeah. and, and you have the flip chart, right? Yeah, we were talking about it. Yeah. Right. And so she, um, she says people sometimes ask her and they, and they say, well, it's interesting because it doesn't seem in your demonstrations, it doesn't seem like you talk about the presenting problem at all. You don't talk <laughs> about why people came in to see you. And she said, that's right. We don't. We talk about the underlying cause, and then sure enough, the presenting problems go away on their own. So we're, fo again, she's got the same idea of focusing on not the behavior, but what's underlying human behaviors. Yeah, it's awesome. And and I know you're a person of faith, and, and mm -hmm. I always use the woman at the well, and I won't go on a long tangent about it, but you know, Jesus does at the end say, go and sin no more, essentially, like, you know, go and do healthy behaviors. But it, there are so many things he interacts with her and being with her and loving on her and drinking with her and letting her tell her own version of the story, right, that is all polyvagal theory, that is all trauma informed. And then it gives him the opportunity to address her behavior. But until she's made safe, until she's seen, until she's known, until she's able to tell her own story, 
in the way that she wants to tell it, whether true or not true, you don't get to changing the behavior or at least changing the behavior for a long term. I mean, I think the behavior can change immediately, but it's going to also cause other behaviors or other situations. Right. You can change surface behaviors with uh, threats and with carrots and sticks, right? You can, you can. Or violence in some cases, yeah. Or violence, right? You can, you can, uh, you can, and what happens to the physiology of the person when, again, it's invisible, but inside the person is going into a threat, fight or flight state, but you see the behavior stop. And oftentimes you think, oh, um, it worked, right? But what happened is that person, that child is frozen. Um, and, and they are not doing the behavior, but they are inside, they're scared and that behavior was going to come back. But, um, the, you know, that analogy of the woman at the well is, is so beautiful because what makes humans feel safe is acceptance, Yeah, is love, is seeing, seeing someone's pain and witnessing it, those powerful human, um, like soothing balm of a relationship. And it seems that we need to remember that above behavior management, the power of, of, of loving relationships and of acceptance. Um, that story to me is one of love and acceptance. Yeah. It's so good. So talk about, um, the, you know, you do a really good job with the sensory processing. Let's get into the, uh, neurodiversity kind of section a little bit. So for me, when, when I read your book, you know, I understood the trauma, you know, a lot of the chapters are so validating for me. And I was talking to my wife about it. I'm like, look, this is what we've been talking about. This is what we're parenting. You know, we have a little uh, calming corner in our closet and we, we, we recently just bought the material. We've been doing it, but we finally, I can't remember the name of the lady, but she has like the printables and then you can frame them and the kid can go in and learn their emotions. And anyway, so we've been doing all that. And as I'm reading your book, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And then I got to the neurodiversity. I was like, oh, wow, this is such a rich area in which, you know, I don't really know. And my wife pointed out, you know, we have a kid with food allergies and um, really bad gut health for two years just wrestling with that. And it was so amazing. I was reading the the part about autism and um, Asperger's and people on the spectrum and how, you know, those things aren't taken into consideration with them, um, their gut health, their um, their sleep their history of trauma. And, and, and I was like, yes, and neither is it with any other sensory type issues, whether it's food allergies. It's like we, we, we're so siloed up in our way of thinking. So can you talk to me about how that developed and that idea or, or you know, a smarter way to talk about it than I'm doing it anyway? Well, no, you did a good job. What, what you're saying is that our body's health, our physical body's health and how our physical body feels impacts every other part of our functioning, including our relationships and our emotions and our behaviors. But we don't typically think this holistically, right? Um, But it's a, it's a fact that underneath that, um, um, under the waterline of the iceberg, we have things like the physical body, for example, um, the quality of sleep that a, a, a human has, a parent or a child, right? The quality of our sleep vastly impacts our ability to have emotional regulation. Mm-hmm. Um, and none of us get thing, enough sleep. And most of us do not get enough sleep, <laughs> right? Uh, that's for sure. And the uh, so in, the second piece is one that is huge that I found with, especially since I um, see so many infants and toddlers in my practice, parents, not, I don't see the infants and toddlers, yeah, yeah. they don't walk in on their own, but they're wonderful parents, in, in, you know, in the, in the consultation, is that we vastly underestimate the importance of understanding how the toddler, the child process the information through their sensory systems. Mm. And each of us have differences in how we process information through our sensory systems. Um, and that's For what example, you would call neurodiversity. Well, uh, yes. I mean, in, in a way, uh, a, a traditional view of neurodiversity is differences in brain wiring or functioning differences in how we ex- uh, understand the world. Right. So many autistic adults that I, that I know um, and teenagers will say that they have huge differences in how they process information from the world. Mm-hmm. 
So being in, um, you know, being in social situations or being in situations where certain types of, of background and foreground noises are there. Um, I think that uh, neurodiversity is, is, is getting um, redefined in, in terms of what it means. Yeah. But I would say, I guess I would say um, that uh, like a, that sensory processing challenges in childhood, I think are fairly common and can be transitory. So I would put, just put that in the typical developmental sphere Okay. because we have to get to know how our child experiences the world. Okay. So what you're saying is, is in general, and we said this earlier, and I think that's why it's hard to, because it is changing as we're talking about it, but in general, right, the norm, which doesn't mean healthy, but the norm kid all have different ways of sensory processing, right? Of taking in things, of taking in words, of taking right. in emotions, their bodies respond differently. And, and that's because of epigenetics and, and family history. And, and, you know, I always call it kind of a dial. Everybody has a dial and it gets spun a different way, depending on the nurture that affects that dial. That's the epigenetic kind of code. Um, and so that's the norm. And then outside of that, you have the, um, very large, but you know, tiny populations of people on the spectrum that are neurodiverse that have drastically different neuro wirings and chemicals account, you know, apart from the quote unquote regular sensory kid is that, or the regular kid. Yeah, I, exactly. And that's why we, it's, it's called a spectrum because yeah. there's such a spectrum. I like your analogy of the dial, right? How, how the dial is turned up or down, depending, like you said, on our epigenetics, on our, on our genetics, on our constitution, on our prenatal environment, on our, on so many different yeah, yeah, for factors. Sure. But, uh, but I think but it's it, important for you to say it because yeah. the average person just, you know, doesn't see that kids don't come out as like blank slate, right? As that's, right. that's tabula rasa that, that we still kind of pretend that like it is the case. We do exactly. And, and so I am very, the first thing I do uh, when I see a child uh, in within a family is, is study how they take in the world. Yeah. So, you know, um, a little, a, a little toddler, for example, who hears things coming down the street, like a, a trash truck coming down the street, they can hear it rumbling, and then they might start looking around or get big eyes, right? That tells us that that hearing is very s sensitive. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if a child in that situation, let's just take hearing, for example, if a toddler has sensitivities to auditory stimulation, meaning sound, sounds or frequencies or volume, or it's a, it's a, it's not just volume, but it's a bunch of different things. Absolutely. Frequency. And if that child um, has these reactions and a caregiver doesn't see them and soothe the child and help the child know that, that, that they're okay, then there's a tendency for the child to develop um, kind of more of this free floating anxiety. And, and oftentimes parents have no idea. They'll, they'll say things like, well, she just starts crying out of the blue. Right. Or he's, he does this weird behavior. He'll, he'll, he'll um, throw something out of the blue. And what I tell really tell parents is that really there isn't, there's always something going on, but oftentimes we don't realize what it is. Oh yeah. And sensory processing is one of those differences that even pediatricians don't talk about it very much. There's a little controversy on it. It barely missed getting into the DSM five. Yeah. A sense, you know, sensory processing disorder. So anyway, but to yeah, me, we could go on that. We could do a whole nother podcast. Go on 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 that. We have to know how our kids, how they, how they see, how they feel things on their skin, how they how what they hear, um, how movement impacts them. Yeah. There's a huge connection to what kids eat and their gut health and, you know, their behavior. I mean, my kids for sure, I can always tell, we try not to do it, but if they eat something with red 40 or they eat something that's, you know, got 17 ingredients in it or whatever, they're yeah. always more irritated, you know, more short tempered. You know, they don't sleep as well. Now I'm, I'm hyper vigilant to that because I know my kids have food allergies and so I've paid attention to it. But that's the thing. It's like we treat kids like there are all these kids who are just normal and they're all the same. And then there are special kids who are outside of that. And we need to kind of, like we talked about with trauma, 
we don't need to yell at those kids. We need to differentiate and calm them and take some extra time with them because they've been harmed. And it's like, right. well, why don't we just take extra time with all of them, you know, and just be yes. kind. <laughs> so. all children, all children need that extra time for us to, to explore what it's like being them to consider what's going on inside of their gut. What's going inside on inside of their tummy, their heart, their, do they have aches and pains that, um, headaches, uh, teeth, toothaches, all these kind of things that impact their, their behaviors. Absolutely. That's so good. Um, so good. I, I'm trying to keep you on track cause I know we got to get, I know you got to get out of here at a certain time. Um, let me see what else I wanted to go over with you. Um, yeah, I mean, that last part was is a key for people is to, I think, in your book, I mean, if they read it and, and see that the chapter on the, the role of sensory, uh, one of the quotes I said is, the role of sensory processing in children's overall development is not yet integrated into the fields of mental health, education, social work, in any comprehensive way, even though it's a foundational piece of the puzzle as we interpret children's behaviors and how to help them. And so, yeah, I would just, I would just tell people to read your book, look at, look at their kids' behaviors, this, you know, what you say is, um, we talk about, you know, like negative behaviors is what people say are offensive. And we would say they're safety seeking. So if they're screaming or yelling or hitting or biting, you know, we have to look past the behavior beyond the behavior as your book's called and figure out, ask some questions. I mean, part of the reason this podcast is called asking why is for that right there is for people to not feel like they can't be, you know, we tell kids all the time, don't ask why, you know, I have two kids right now that ask me why about everything. And my instinct is to be like, cause I said, so, you know, <laughs> yes. get it in the van. Uh, you know. <laughs> right. and, and sometimes I do, um, you know, but yes, of at, course you do. at the end of the day, um, we should feel free as adults to ask those questions about our kids, to lean in, to take some time. And I feel so bad for all of us because, you know, again, like you said, you're not trying to shame people. But the system's not set up for that. So everybody's kind of doing the old way. And so then you feel shame for even trying to dig in. You go to your pediatrician and you're like, well, no, I think my parent gut says this. And they give you this particular kind of booklet and this model and this thing. And you're like, wait, this doesn't feel right. But then you feel like you don't want to be arrogant and tell your doctor what to do. And then you get in fight or flight and then you feel shame. And then, you know, oh, it's, the, it's the big so cycle. It's so uncomfortable. Yes. It's, it's because we're not all reading from the same manual. Yeah. No. <laughs> right. For and sure. we really are coming from different languages. And I have so many parents that arrive at my door um, after they've tried to do what their well intentioned pediatrician is saying. Like, you just have to crack down more. You just have to be more consistent. You just have to, you, you're, you're letting the child off too easy or whatever, kind of, you know, trying to, be a cheerleader for the parent, but, but when that doesn't work, you know, and then we go deeper, then we realize we're not all understanding childhood behaviors in the same way, in the same framework. And, um, I'm, my hope is that beyond behaviors will help us, uh, feel good, better about our parenting because we will have a little bit more knowledge across the whole body. Absolutely. And that was the gift of the decade of the brain. And now we need to transport that rich information into clinical practice, into parenting and into education. No, it's fantastic. And I, I love that because it, it's so important if we are going to see our, I mean, if we look at our culture and everybody asks this, right, they're like, why is, why is this so bad? Or why are people like this? Or why don't people care anymore? And why are people so desensitized? And why, you know, why, why, why? And it's like, well, we were all children and we all grew up for decades and decades recovering from all this trauma and all the systemic racism and all this poverty and all these things. And we are just now looking at why that happened. And now we're just finally trying to integrate that into the different systems and fields so that hopefully, I mean, I, I think about the police force, you know, I have a cop who goes out to a family's house and the child's being disobedient and yelling and screaming and talking disrespectfully. Well, the, the police officer doesn't have any of this training and they don't know any, any different. They don't know what you just told me and what you you've written and what we've talked about. And so they say, yeah, just, you know, whoop your kid and he'll listen. You need to put him in your place. He doesn't know that the week before the parent did beat the kid for the entire week. And now in this one moment, the kid's acting back out or trying to stand up for themselves or trying to find safety. 
And I'm not, and like you would say, I'm not saying that's good behavior and we want that to happen. But we, ha- we have to equip police officers, firefighters, teachers, therapists on how to, that this information so that when they're going into it, they're assuming some things, right? They're, they're not assuming like, I know they're assuming that they need to get to know. Does that make sense? It's like the assumption should be, I need to go in as a learner because I don't have this all figured out. And if I see behavior, it might not mean what I think it means. Yes, exactly. And again, with, without, without shaming individual people, because it's, this the, the information now is kind of catch as you can it's it's if you if you happen to get a certain training a lot of you know some police departments have are beginning training Absolutely. on trauma it's trauma informed care but i'd like it to to move to trauma responsive care but oh, I like here's that. the right so informed is understanding something responsive is actually beginning to use it and um, I, I'm hoping that, and, I, and I'm, I am hopeful, I am hopeful that education and law enforcement, if, if for no other reason than to stem the school to prison pipeline, Absolutely. right? Because we know it's there and we want to figure out how to s- slow down that rate. And, and it appears that trauma responsive care, which like you said so beautifully, should be human care. Right. For everybody, not just for trauma survivors or toxic stress uh, survivors, but for little humans, for big humans, and likely not the type of, of parenting many of us had because our parents did did the best they jo- job they knew how, but they didn't have this information either. Right. Yeah, I think I think you're so right. And I we have here in Shreveport two police officers, two, two, uh, well, Shreveport and Bozier, who have approached me in the last month to come in and do trainings. And so I'm totally going to still... <laughs> Uh, that idea of, not, of switching it from trauma informed care to what do you trauma responsive care? Trauma or? responsive care. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, right. if you don't mind me stealing that, I'm gonna. No, I'm gonna use it. and it wasn't mine. I I can't remember who where I who I got it from, but from the trauma um, from the trauma literature, uh, you moving to trauma responsive is really exciting. Because no, that's so awesome. Now we're responding because that's actually what I mean when I say it. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's more it's more accurate because you're embodying it and. Clint, you are a, a human that is is kind and and can witness human pain and be present. So I'm just so grateful for the work you're doing in the world to share this with others and you embody it as a good human as well. So thank you thank so you. much. Well, it's been awesome to have you on here. I know you got a busy day. I love your work. I know hopefully we'll keep in contact and, and be support for one another. But if you're listening, um, can you give them some of the information about where they can find your book and your website and all that kind of stuff? Oh, sure. Yes. Thank you so much for having me again. Um, I can, my website is monadelahook.com and on Facebook, I'm a Mona Delahook PhD and Twitter and Instagram at Mona Delahook, my name. Um, and I'd love to hear from people and I, I share, try to share on social media, kind of the studies that are coming out that I feel are holistic and accurate and the research and information that will help parents and teachers and everybody, all providers, um, make more informed choices. So, um, yeah, it's a joyful journey. I'm really happy to be doing this work. Thank well, you. it's awesome. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, God bless you. And, and guys, if you're listening out there, thank you for listening to the asking why podcast and go subscribe, like, um, follow her page. You get great information. Follow our, our page at Clint Davis counseling, uh, dot com. You can listen to the podcast or follow the links to Instagram or, uh, Facebook. Uh, God bless you and have a good day. Thank you, Mona. Do the same. Bye. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, ma'am.